them to be able to do and to accomplish. And so that's why there's hope for revival. When we look at the situation, the circumstances that we're in, we're thinking what can be done. Well, Jeremiah was living in some difficult times, maybe even more difficult than our times today, if you could believe that. It was so bad that God entirely judged the nation and sent them into captivity. And, you know, when I look at what Jeremiah was going through, the United States isn't very far from that. So, you know, a lot of times we're just going on, living life and thinking, man, this is just going to continue. That's the way they thought. Zedekiah, who was the president at that time, or the king, <laughs> the leader of the country, he was very confident that uh, they were going to win the battle, that they were going to win the day. And yet Zedekiah, if you talk about a horrible judgment, a country executing judgment on another country, they took Zedekiah's sons, executed all of his children right before, right before him, and then poked out his eyes. The last thing he saw was all of his children being killed, and his eyes are blinded, and they haul him off as a prisoner of war. He was arrogant. He refused the word of God. He thought he knew more than God, and that's the judgment that fell upon him. The whole nation was hauled off, not everyone, but most of the people, and it was an incredible thing, and we don't, somehow we don't think that that can happen, but I'm telling you, there's so many things that are going on. The, 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 the hope that we have is there's a remnant, you know, a remnant. And that we'll learn, like Jeremiah, to pray in the midst of uh, all the tough things that are going on. And, you know, you say, well, Pastor, I don't like hearing these negative messages. This is a positive message because it's saying that we as a people of God can make a difference. We can make a difference, not by uh, our politics, but by our prayers. I mean, I'm not against politics. I'm not against being involved in the political system. But... I am against trusting in politics and not trusting in God and not praying. And Jeremiah was tremendous in prayer. We're going to also look at Job, who had gone through a horrible catastrophe in his own life and questioned God and who he was and his workings. And then he ends up with a revival in his soul. But it's also a message of prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to look at God's word here this morning, and we're thinking of the theme of revival. Father, we come to you. We cry out to you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see the seriousness of the hour, that we would just quit trusting and that we've done this before, that we've been here, and that like Samson, we'll rise up and shake ourselves and that we'll win the day. And yet he ended up, like Zedekiah with his eyes poked out, grinding in a prison. And Lord, when we become arrogant and haughty and when we reject you and we don't stand for the truth, and that we, the people of God, as James so aptly read, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, each one of those four points so important in revival Yes, we must pray. We must seek your face, not your hand. Uh, we must not turn our backs upon you. But we also must turn from our wicked way. Lord, help us to experience revival in our hearts today, starting with me, but starting with all of us, Lord. Help us all to draw a circle around our life and say, Lord, let revival begin here today. We always want to point our fingers at everybody else, but we should draw a circle around ourselves and say, here is where revival needs to begin. Let it begin in me. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to say it's great to see Norman Meek here. Amen. He's had a lot of physical elements. He, he kind of had a fall, and uh, that led to a whole lot of other things and all kinds of difficulties, but he's here today. Amen. And he's walking better than he's walked in, in weeks and weeks. And uh, we're so thankful that he's here this morning. But you know, whenever you start seeking God, what does the enemy do? He attacks, he'll trip you, he'll do anything he can to try to hurt you. And thank God Norman was seeking the Lord. And 
man, all of a sudden, it seems like all hell breaks out against him. But we're more than conquerors, and we can get the victory. I'm also glad to see Willie. The last time I saw him, he's in the hospital. He's here today. Amen. What am I saying? I'm saying that God is able to do anything. God has power. God can move. And this is the story of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32, if you want to turn your Bibles there. And the message basically is uh, 26, 27, verse 26, 27. But I'm going to start at verse 1 so that we can understand the passage. But I do want you to see the main verses. Two verses here that we'll end up focusing on. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So this is God's word. And it came to Jeremiah, who's been called the weeping prophet. Behold, I am the Lord. And that's literally the personal name of God. I am Yahweh. I am the great I am. I am who I am. As the black preacher said, I be who I be. Amen. And that's exactly what it is. It's the verb to be. I be who I be. I am. Whatever you need, I have been who I've always been. I do not change. If perfection changed, it would be imperfection. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. We're flesh. He's God. But yet we want to run our lives. We want to be in control. Flesh. Flesh stinks. And what happens when somebody dies, when something dies, when an animal dies? You know, uh, this cat died here in our city, and, you know, the first day or two it's not so bad. But every day that it stays there dead on the street, it stinks. It's starting to stink. Because flesh stinks, it rot, it, it's rotten, we're flesh. I am the Lord, I am a personal God who relates to you, I am who I am, I want to know you, I want to have a relationship with you, but I am the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Some of you are saying, yeah, our present situation is too hard. There's no way out. But God says something different. Is anything too hard for me? Hey, believe it. You know, you're not breaking into hallelujahs like you should be. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans. That wasn't what that, that uh, the people might want. But it was what the people needed. So those are the main verses. But let's go back to verse 1. And I want you to see the work of God. And I also want you to notice that it wasn't Socrates who came up with uh, this method of teaching. God himself uses questions. He's always asking us questions. How many of you know that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God didn't come and just preach to him a sermon. He came and he asked them questions. Where are you? What's going on? Did you? Did you eat of the, of the fruit that I told you? Did you? You know, what have you done? And that's what God, God's Holy Spirit, he comes and he asks questions. And what's going on with you? What are you doing? What's happening in your life? What, what is God to, to me? You know, he, he doesn't just come and preach a sermon. He asks us questions. He, he, he wants us to answer those questions and know and understand. But we don't like answering those questions because it's a reminder that we want to be God of our life. We want to control our life, but we're just stinking flesh. And you never know. Uh, we had, had a young lady that attended our church for a while and she had to have an operation and they believed that her muscles were actually inside of her body and they were rotting and they were dying inside of her they had to cut her open and operate or else she would have lost her leg it's like her muscles were dying rotting right inside of her body and that's the way we are man we are rotten and we need help we need god to cut us open and operate us but it's our heart we got bad hearts we got dis deceived hearts and we need him to do something in our life well, Jeremiah, look at it, verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. 
So here's a king that's not a great king, but he's been king for 10 years. It's the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah. So the king of Judah is Zedekiah. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him, saying, So why was Jeremiah in prison? He was in prison because he preached the word of God. He said, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord? Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans but shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak with him face to face and see him eye to eye. Boy, that was a relevant prophetic word from Jeremiah, wasn't it? But he didn't see him the way he wanted to see him. He saw him and then he saw no more. The last thing he saw was his children executed and then the king putting his eyes out. And he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall remain until I visit him, declares the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. Why are you saying this? And I think Jeremiah would say, because it's the truth. It's true. It's what God told me to say. And that didn't matter to the king. The king says, I know more than God. I know more than you. I know more than everything. I'm just going to go on my way and do it my way. Instead of repenting, if he would have repented, there would have been hope. But he didn't repent. He didn't seek God's face. He just pursued in his stubborn way. Jeremiah said, this is verse 6, The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Well, that's an amazing thing. He's in prison. And he's going to have a visitor, and the visitor's going to say, buy my field. And it's like he's doing business behind bars. <laughs> but it's God. God came to him. The Lord came to me. And he said that. Notice, then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, by my field that is at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. How do you know that a prophet speaking the truth? It comes true. What God says to you comes true. He says it, and it happens, and here it is. God told him this is going to happen, and it's exactly what happened. It's telling us that Jeremiah is a faithful prophet who speaks the truth. So notice verse 9, and I bought the field. Now he's a prisoner. And what's he doing? He's, he's, he's in prison, but he buys this field. I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I mean, that's a pretty handy sum. And yet he does it. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. So here he is, he's a prisoner, but he's doing business behind bars. Sounds like today's prisons, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, then they're, they're ordering all kinds of things. Then verse 11, Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Darius, son of Masai, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware vessel that they may last for a long time. It was, isn't it amazing the wisdom that they had? If you wanted to preserve a document, you didn't put it in a safety deposit box. You put it in an earthenware vessel. And that's where they found the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls that lasted for so long, the book of Isaiah that totally matched up, just word for word matched up. It had been, it had been preserved and it matched up with the Isaiah that we have in our Bible, just the, everybody's saying, you can't trust the Bible. It's been 
handled by men and it's not faithful. And then all of a sudden, God enabled them to find these scrolls that were hundreds and hundreds of years old and they found it and it was word for word what we have in our Bible today. Amen. What am I saying? I'm saying you can trust God's holy word. You can trust God's prophets. You can trust what the word of God says. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. So get this. He says, judgment is coming. You're going to be captured. You're going to be taken to, to Babylon. But revival's coming. Restoration's going to happen. And he bought a field. He bought property saying, I believe God's word. And I'm going to do what he says. And my people are going to be farming this land. Hey, that's the confidence that he had that he was hearing from God. And he was delivering God's word. He acted upon the word of God. And this is where many people fail today. You hear God's word, but you don't act upon it. You don't do what he says to do. You may say amen to it. You may like, you may even laugh, you may enjoy what you're hearing. But if you don't do it, you're not doing what God wants you to do. He wants you to obey. He wants you to change your life. If my people who are called by my name, you, you have to humble yourself. You have to turn from your wicked way. You have to pray. You have to seek his face. Those are things that have to be done. And if we don't do those things, revival is not going to come. We have to. It's God's word. And we can plan and scheme and plot and all of that. And I'm telling you, we can get thrown in jail. We can be ostracized and all kinds of bad things can happen. But as long as we trust God, we're going to, be, we're going to come out okay. And if they do kill us, what's the worst thing that can happen? We'll go to heaven. <laughs> uh, that's not too bad, is it? I mean, they take your old dead body and they can do all kinds of shameful things to it. But that's okay because you're already going to be with, with Jesus. You're already going to be in heaven. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me. We're in paradise. You're going to be with me. And if I'm with Jesus, I'm okay. And you're okay, right? We're all okay. That's the way you should have wrote that book. I'm okay, you're okay. No, only if we're with Jesus, with him, we're okay. Are you with Jesus? Is he with you? Now we're at verse 16. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord. So he's heard the word of God. He's been obedient to God. And what does he do now? He's made the purchase and he prays. And he says, ah, Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. How did Jeremiah pray? He says, you are creator God. Why do you think the devil pushes the obnoxious, unscientific theory of evolution? And why do people believe it, hook, line, and sinker? Why do they believe it? I mean, it's incredible how people will believe something that, you know, billions and billions and billions of years ago, something happened. <laughs> It's like, what? You're trusting in billions of years instead of the plain word of God that he's prophesied and he's told us, he's told us about Jesus. He described everything to about his life, hundreds of years, even thousands of years before it happened. And it all came exactly the way it was said and it was planned. And yet you're trusting billions of years more than you're trusting God's word. No, the devil's going to attack. Creation, anytime you start preaching creation, you're going to have all kinds of doubts because that's what the devil does. He casts doubt. He casts dispersions upon the word of God. He attacks it. But notice Jeremiah says, you have created us. You made this massive earth and this world in which we're living. And he says, nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands. James said that. 
Hey, if you just think about how much God loves you, it'd take your worries away and change your life. Listen, nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. So he's the Lord of the armies. Angelic angel, an angelic army that one angel can kill 600,000 men. He's the Lord of hosts. And we can rise up in rebellion against Him and we can put all of our atomic weapons and everything against Him and just like that, He'll destroy it all. Trust in your God. Don't believe the foolish lies of the devil. Trust God's Word. O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the children of man. He knows what we're doing. He sees it all. Rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. In the midst of all kinds of wickedness, if you live a godly, righteous life, he will take note of that and he will take care of you. He sees you. Amen. You think, oh, nobody sees me. Nobody cares about poor little old me. Nobody knows all the struggles and all the stuff that I'm going through. I'm saying God knows. God sees and God cares. He cares about his godly people. He cares about his children. You have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and to this day in Israel and among all mankind and have made a name for yourself as at this day. He's reminding himself of all of God's mighty exploits of the past to say that this is the God I'm praying to, a God who has power, a God who can do anything. Nothing is too hard. We need to learn to pray like this. But some of you are so filled with unbelief, you don't even know if God created the heavens and the earth. And if you do, you believe that he did it through millions and millions of years instead of believe the way that it says in the Bible. You brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders and with a strong hand and outstretched arm and with great terror. And you gave them this land which you swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And they entered and took possession of it but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They did nothing of all you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have made all this disaster come upon them. He said, what's happening today is because we disobeyed God. We turned our back on God. We didn't do what he told us to do. We didn't get here without a reason, without a cause. And I'm saying... We need revival. We need a genuine work of God in our lives. Behold, the siege mounds have come up to the city to take it. And because of sword and famine and pestilence, sword, that's the armies will get you, famine, lack of food. How many times do you say, oh, man, I wanted to buy this, but I couldn't get it. I had to go over to I had to go to Yuma to get it, or I had to go to San Diego to find the food that I needed to fix this that I needed. That's just the beginning of problems. Pestilence. We got COVID, and then there's all these new things. Had monkeypox. I mean, it's just incredible, all the things. But isn't it amazing how that most of these things are, are acts of the devil trying to destroy us and to kill us, or it's acts of of a judgment of God against sexual sins on the part of us that brings incredible horrors upon the world because we turn our back on God and we think we know more than God. And all of a sudden we have uh, AIDS taking out multitudes of talented people because we think we know more than God. Swords, famine, pestilence. The city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke has come to pass, and behold, you see it. Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses. He, he said, I can't believe it. Here I am, I'm in prison. 
and I'm broke. I don't have hardly anything. And now you want me to say, give everything that I've got to buy. And yet we're going into captivity. Judgment's coming. But God, because you say it, I'm going to do it. And he did it. And he says, and it's kind of like he's wanting confirmation. Like, Lord, did I really hear what you said? I mean, this doesn't make any sense. Yet you, O oh Lord God, have said to me, you told me what's going to come to pass, and yet you said, buy the field for money and get witnesses. It's like you're crazy. Though the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans, it doesn't make sense, God. And then it says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord. Again, the covenant name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? So his prayer was, in verse 17, nothing is too hard for you. And God answered him, you're right, Jeremiah, nothing. Is anything too hard for me? See, it's a question. Jeremiah, am I going to harm you? You know, Jeremiah 29, he said, I know the plans that I have for you, the plans to prosper you, to give you hope. He says, Jeremiah, is anything too hard for me? Have you noticed how that we can see? Jeremiah even writes this word. I know the plans I have for you to prosper you, plans to give you hope. And yet you say, God, you're going to destroy our nation. We're going to be judged and taken away. And yet then you tell me this. And God just says, hey, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, not just Israelites of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I'm giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against the city shall come and set the city on fire and burn it with the Houses on whose roofs offerings have been made to Baal and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods to provoke me to anger. In other words, God says, I'm going to ex execute judgment through an army against you because you've abandoned God. That's why I'm saying, <laughs> be careful. That's why I'm saying we better repent. Because how many times have we poured out money and offerings in our life for things that are just false gods, idols, that don't mean anything. And we haven't given ourselves and our money and our time and our energy to the thing that matters. And that's knowing God's word, obeying it, and putting it into practice. Just because you know it, just because intellectually you've got it up here, doesn't mean you've got it. It's when it grasps your heart. When it gets a hold of your heart and changes the direction of your life. That's when something happens. People can have all kinds of stuff up here, but they don't have it here. 800 and something times the word heart is used in the, the word of God. 90 something times the word mind is used. It's our heart he wants. He wants our mind too. And he can renew our mind, but this is where he's going. This deceitful, desperately wicked heart that he changes and gives us a heart to know him and to love him. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. The children of Israel have done nothing but promote me, provoke me to anger by the work of their hands. So judgment comes because we abandon God. So I'm saying it's not as bad as it was here, but we're getting close. <laughs> We're getting close. Uh, James was telling me a statistic. I don't know what it was exactly, but it was like at one point there were a whole lot of people that were going to church, and now there's not hardly anybody that's going to church. And the younger generation is like less than, what, 5%, James, did you say? Yeah, yeah, somewhere in like some 5 and 10%, like really small number of people, young people. It only takes one generation to lose a nation. That's all.
This city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day so that I will remove her from my sight because of all the evil of the children of Israel, the children of Judah, that they did to provoke me to anger. And it just goes on and on. Verse 33, they have turned to me their back and not their face. And the blessed promise is seek my face. And the psalmist answers, your face, Lord, I will seek. And, and that's what you want. You know, it's like, how, how many parents like it when your kids come and this is all they want? Hey, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me, give me. Or how do you like it when they're looking at you and there's just all kinds of love and admiration and they are just so thankful to be in your presence and they love you and they're obedient. Oh, isn't that great? Don't you love those moments when they're looking and smiling, their faces are radiant because they've seen you? And they're glad that you're there and they want to be with you. Oh my goodness, that's awesome. But you wonder, so where in the world did they learn that kind of praying? Give me, give me, give me. They learned it from you. They learned it from us. Because that's how we pray. God, give me this, give me that. Instead of God, give us revival. God, help me to have some time in your word today. God, help me to prioritize my life. Help me, Lord, to be excited about your things. Help me to seek your face. God, Help me to be what you want me to be. We, give me this, give me, and I've got this going and this going and this. And I'm saying, let's get our hearts after God. That's what revival is, seeking God. If you seek me, you'll find me. If you seek me with all your heart, that's the word of God from Jeremiah in chapter 33. Just a, another ver another chapter. This is the way to life. And I'm saying you can change it for your kids. Thank God for all the kids that we have. Don't you love it? All of our children, how precious they are. Well, let's love them enough to get revival, to get rid of this foolishness and this uh, amazing horrors. And I'm going to show you that this is exactly what Jeremiah is talking about because when a country is destroyed, little kids get killed. Why are they going in and killing our kids? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's the enemy hates them. He wants to kill and destroy your children. But you can rise up against that. And you can learn to pray with power. And you can change the destiny of a nation and of your family. But we've got to learn to pray. Now notice... Verse 33, we will repeat it. They have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. They set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it, disrespecting the house of God, the church of God, not even wanting to come, not even wanting to be there. You know, you might get them to a youth group where you're having all kinds of fun and game, but no way you can get them to the house of God. They built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up, get it, listen, to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I did not con command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So they offered up their sons and daughters to Molech. It's given your children over to idolatry. Given your children, it's like this, aborting your children. But it even is worse than that. Allowing your children to say, well, I think I'm a boy today when you're a girl, or I think I'm a girl today when I'm a boy. And allowing that and patting that on the back and thinking that that's a good thing. Listen, are you going to believe what all of this world is promoting, which is backed by Satan, or are you going to listen to God's holy word? See, see, we, we have this book. And what I preach may not be popular. It might get us thrown off of every kind of media under the sun. <laughs> but who cares? We only have 10, 15, 20 people listening anyway. <laughs> Why? They don't want to hear what I have to say. Because I, I really believe that I'm preaching God's word and, and speaking truth. See, they, they, they don't care about the family. So, wow, time flies when you're having fun, right? <laughs> okay. So, 
I just want us to go to, to, to the book of Job to close out. Just to, this is, I'm going to use this as an example just to show you the, the series of questions and answers. And there's a lot of questions and answers going on. And sometimes it's not the way that we want. But you know that Job, uh, God allowed the devil to attack his family, to attack his riches, his possessions. Then he actually came after Job himself with sickness. God allowed all of that, but he kept him from dying. And then Job has these friends that come and kind of pile on, you know. And, they, and you, have, you have all of them from every brand of religion coming with their ideals of why Job is suffering. Uh, but uh, finally, God is uh, kind of tired of hearing Job doing all of his complaining. Now, and notice chapter 38. And we're only going to read just a few verses uh, as we flip through. But notice 38 verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said. You remember Elijah? You know, he, he wasn't in the wind, he wasn't in this. But here with Job, he was in the whirlwind. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, and no, notice it's all questions. Who is this? that darkens counsel by words without knowledge. Dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and you make it known to me. And then it's like hundreds and hundreds of questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? <laughs> Mr. Job, you're criticizing me, you're condemning me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Job was saying, he was basically almost saying, I'm more righteous than God. You guys are accusing me of sin. And God had even said that about him. He's the most just, righteous person on earth. And yet he allowed him to be attacked. And yet Job needed to learn some things. And a lot of times when we're suffering, it's like, God, why are you allowing this? This is just unjust. Well, unjust suffering goes with being a Christian, with being a follower. That's going to happen because... There's an enemy, Satan, he hates us. And he's just going to keep attacking us. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. God, you know, you'd ask him, well, how big is the earth? And he could just tell you just like that. Ah, it's 25,239 circumference, surface, land mass, all of this. How far? What about that star? He's, he, he's got it all. You know, he's just amazing. He's God. Amen. He created this. He's and yet, this God who's so huge and humongous, Isaiah says, is so little that He knows each one of us by name and will look us into the eye and see us face to face. And we look and it says, that can't be true. But it is true. And that big God is the one who will judge the world in righteousness. So let's believe it. And let's change the way we live. And let's let him be God and every man a liar. And it's just like hundreds of questions. And then 39, verse 1, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? I'm going like, what in the world does that have to do with it? But I guess nobody knew when the mountain goats had their kids, but God did. <laughs> Amen. And then notice verse 40. Uh, chapter 40, verse 1, And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. And he's asking hundreds of questions that Job hasn't got a clue. But he's smart enough to know, God, you're being unrighteous with me. Why are you putting me through all of this? <laughs> Contending with God. Did any of you kind of in that club of Job, why this, why that? And God just, he could answer everything and it never satisfy. You'd never be satisfied. He doesn't even take time to answer the questions. He's just saying, think about it. Here you are finding fault with me. So then notice verse three. Then Job answered the Lord. So he's had hundreds and hundreds of questions. And finally he speaks, and this is what he says. Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. 
I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. <laughs> Isn't that like he's had a little question and answer session with God, and he's just like, mm. whoa. <laughs> I'm telling you, a lot of times we say, I've seen God. No, if we've seen God, we'd give up our foolishness. And we would get serious about his word. And then notice verse 6. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. So he spoke in the whirlwind. He answers him again. And he dressed for action like a man. Dress for action like a man. You know, get ready for some hard work. And then there's more questions. He says, get ready. Get ready. And uh, then in verse chapter 42, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's what Jeremiah is saying. God said to Jeremiah, is there anything that I can't do? Is there anything too hard for me? That's what he said to Job. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything that I can't do? I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So I'm saying if we will do what James said at the beginning, if we will humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked way, God will heal our land. He will restore. Don't say it can't happen. It can God can do anything. Nothing is impossible with him. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful me, for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's where we need to be. Repenting. Repenting. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends. For you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job, and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For what you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. So he says, you know, Job, you're kind of messed up, but your friends are even worse. <laughs> it's like sometimes we say, ah, oh, you know, I'm not that bad. You know, my, my friend, oh, they're really terrible. Yeah, but we're all bad. We're all messed up. But isn't it amazing that when we humble ourselves and repent, what has God done? He gives us power in our prayers. And he enables us to offer sacrifice, to preach Jesus Christ and lift him up. We, we, don't, we don't have authority to preach because of who we are, but because of him and what he gives to us. And it's the humility and it's seeking him and going after him. And it gives us power in our lives to minister to others. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. You see, when there's obedience, when there's prayer, when there's the doing of what God says, then there's restoration. And that's exactly what happened. The rest of the story, God restores their fortunes. Revival comes when we repent and we turn to God and we turn from our wicked ways and we seek him. I want to encourage you. There's hope. Don't give up. Don't say nothing good can happen. It can. Things can turn around. But we have to believe God. And we have to believe that nothing is too hard for God. Amen. Listen to Job. Listen to Jeremiah. They've done some good preaching to us today. Amen. Not me, I'm just reading their words. They did some awesome preaching to us today, but mostly it was God, Jehovah, another J, Jehovah, that did some awesome preaching to us today. There's nothing too hard for him.
Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would use that word to speak to our hearts. Help us to seek you, to cry out to you. Help us, Lord. We need revival, all of us, to take seriously your word and to live a life of holiness and also to pray and to seek your face. Help us to repent in dust and ashes and to really believe your word. And then we'll be able to pray. Then we'll be able to minister Jesus, his blood, and we'll have power in what we say and what we do. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn. What number is it? Uh, it's up here on the board. We'll, we'll have people here praying with you. We'll be glad to pray with you if you need help.